Hello. So today I'm going to talk about open and fair science in an institutional context. Uh, this is a talk uh, that is held at the Fraunhofer Institute for Biomedical Technology. And uh, the slides as well as the recording can be found via this Zenodo um, DOI. And then there is a file associated uh, with this talk where uh, you can post questions and comments. Okay, let's dive in. There's a graphical summary. So um, when you see any of these images pop up, uh, the important pieces of the uh, talk can be found. So here, um, this signifies the research cycle and basically uh, the idea that you can share research all along the research cycle. Um, this one emphasizes that research is a collaborative process and uh, yeah, in involves individuals and also machines and tools. And open science basically allows anyone to uh, participate in that, at least observe and ideally participate. This one here uh, signifies the moment when data are being shared. So whenever this penguin um, crosses this door, this gate, uh, then some data is being sent around the world and th such data can be shared in principle. And this one here um, stands for the concept of reusing scientific information. Um, and this one here in the middle basically um, stands for standards and, and uh, technical infrastructure that enables all of this. Okay. So structure of the talk, uh, we have these uh, different sections and then your task is to identify the areas where any of the things discussed here would be of interest to you or IBM T more generally. Um, and then uh, we have these back channels where you can uh, ask questions or post comments or you can uh, also just um, ask me directly, interrupt my uh, presentation that's completely fine I can do monologues but I actually prefer dialogue okay so here is this etherpad its URL is included on in the footer of every slide so you uh, if you can't type it down now then uh, you can check it out later or uh, at any slide and then for things that are a bit more complex uh, there is um, a dedicated uh, question and answer site uh, around open science or you can just email me I'll uh, show the email at the end as well okay a bit about me um, I'm a biophysicist who actually did his PhD at the Fraunhofer Institute of Biomedical Engineering um, but uh, that is 15 years uh, ago and uh, I was working in other contexts uh, since but I recently joined them back and I'm now part of the biomedical data and bioethics team. I'm also um, at the University of Virginia School of Data Science. I'm a contributor to Open Science, Citizen Science and Wikimedia projects. I'm an editor of the Open Science Journal Research Ideas and Outcomes. This is my identifier on ORCID, which is an identifier system for a researcher. And this is my identifier on Twitter, which is a social networking platform. Um, and yeah, I'm looking forward to questions, comments and collaborations. Okay. We are now entering the open science part. First, it's important to uh, basically just have some sort of an idea of a research ecosystem, different components. So here we have some basically set, uh, basic needs of uh, human life. Um, then we have certain actors that act around those basic needs. They have certain, let's say, mechanisms that they use in their actions and those mechanisms interact with the environment be this uh, like society in general or the uh, natural environment and in this context open science basically means uh, that uh, any interaction between the different actors or any uh, step in a process involved in those mechanisms here uh, can be made open at least in principle and open uh, comes in different shades. So very important is the open licensing of the data, the code and the media that are being shared, etc. cetera. Uh, also uh, openness of the process, whereby everyone can participate in the process or at least observe it, but also actively contribute if they so choose. 
Um, and yeah, in principle, um, the participation is extended to anyone who wants it. And then also important that uh, whenever there's a change to the documentation or to the scholarly record, then uh, it is publicly versioned. Okay, so um, then research is not just an ecosystem of actors, uh, but they also act on their acts. They essentially are processes and uh, research uh, itself can also be visualized as a process. So you can start uh, with um, like an idea, then this idea is transformed into things like um, methods, then those methods generate data, the data being combined with software, and then in the end you have something to write about. Um, yeah, so this is, um, these are just examples. You could do this at any step in the research cycle. Yeah, so here we have uh, some more about the research cycle. And uh, it's important to uh, kind of be aware that um, it doesn't act in a vac vacuum. So um, part of that landscape that I sketched out earlier means that the actors involved in the research cycle, like for instance, researchers or technicians, or, uh, they might also be involved in uh, what I call here satellite activities, so related activities. That is, for instance, technical support, it's outreach, it's teaching, it's administration and related matters. And also here, um, it, openness at every step is possible in principle um, and um, the open science, like a open science idea basically means that you encourage openness at every step. You don't really require it, uh, but you encourage it and you encourage people to experiment along those lines. Uh, importantly, openness can also be uh, achieved like retroactively, like you um, open up the documentation of all the research you have done. Um, that's fine as well, that aids reproducibility. Uh, but the open science aspect that you're losing here is that of open participation by anyone. Uh, so getting early feedback from the wider community and those kinds of things. Um, yeah, and the in interactions between the research and those satellite activities should, uh, should ideally also be uh, open in the sense that, for instance, you could reuse some materials that have been generated as part of research uh, by inclusion in teaching materials um, uh, and so on, or outreach materials, um, or vice versa. You could actually uh, do some teaching sessions where someone uh, is actually uh, going through open notebooks, for instance. So uh, then we have um, research as a collaborative process. So research um, is an inter basically it's, it's a process that involves a number of minds, um, often many more than one, and uh, they use some tools in order to generate insights or at least data, and um, then. Open science means that uh, at every step things are being shared, every uh, at every step things are being documented in detail, so as to enable reproducibility, to facilitate re uh, collaboration and also reuse. And so essentially everyone is invited to observe what they are doing or to reuse whatever they have posted on any of those websites. So uh, the open landscape is complicated and there is basically something for everyone's taste um, from open education, open knowledge, to open music, open standards, open hardware, open business and open content. Uh, and it's all based around the, uh, uh, let's say the forerunner open source. Very important is open standards. Yeah. Then, well, if you have questions about open science, there is a dedicated uh, question and answer uh, website called Ask Open Science that I uh, invite you to post things like questions that you think might be of interest to others as well, not just you. Um, okay, this was the open science part. We can now enter the data sharing part. So here, this penguin, as I already briefly mentioned, uh, when they cross the gate, um, data is being generated. So they are measured in height and weight, and uh, the, they're also identified. And the fact that they just crossed that gate is being transmitted via satellite uh, to a lab in the UK. 
and uh, they can then analyze the data in real time. And I chose this uh, for, for a number of reasons. First, it actually shows the moment of data generation uh, very nicely. So you have here to, uh, like, once they enter this uh, light sensor and here this light sensor, it's in between passing through those that the data generation actually happens. Um, and this way uh, they can be counted. Uh, but the fact that no researcher is around here, um, it's all essentially automated, means that we have the technological means to share data uh, essentially immediately uh, all around the globe and even beyond, like from space uh, onto Earth or vice versa. And uh, the, so the, the lack of sharing in certain parts of the research ecosystem is often not a technical um, issue. It uh, is a conscious or unconscious choice uh, not to share. And um, there are some very valid reasons for not sharing, and there are some uh, reasons that are that may be better described as habits or traditions. So um, d data, once they're digital, they can be shared through private networks, which is kind of still the default. Uh, and they could could also be uh, shared through uh, like online. They could be, once they're online, they can be publicly online. Once they're publicly online, they can be openly online. Um, and the difference here is that openly online means that anyone can reuse it without having to ask or pay or anything like that. And also, it's important that data can, in principle, be shared at scale automatically. Uh, and, uh, like with machines and uh, with anyone who is interested. And, but here I, I say in principle, because there are uh, some valid categories of reasons uh, for not sharing data, like for instance, to save the privacy of a patient or of a, uh, an archeological site or the nesting ground of a rare species or something like this. So my background is in biophysics. So here are just some examples of how data sharing looks like in biophysics. You have sharing across spatial scales, uh, across temporal scales, essentially everything covered by life from a molecular level, level to the biosphere, from femtoseconds to millions of years. Um, we're sh and we have sharing between uh, and across biological species and, and even including engineered variants. Uh, we have lots of methodological approaches in, in the field, in the lab, or elsewhere. We have uh, interactions between experimentalists, theorists, empiricists, and others. We have interactions between biology, physics, and beyond. So, for instance, typically chemistry is involved, medicine, pharmacology, ecology, those kinds of things. And we have interactions between academia, industry, government, non-government, uh, citizen science, others. Uh, and this happens globally. Yeah. So um, another circumstance under which data sharing often happens or is triggered or is becoming uh, notable in some way is actually disasters. So humanity as a whole has a long history of sharing um, in response to disasters and uh, data sharing is relatively new in this context, but over the last few years it has reached a certain prominence. Um, and Disaster-related data typically has uh, a rather low veracity, but it has high velocity and volume and variety and also potentially very high impact. So uh, affected populations um, and environments or, or those that are recently affected by disasters, they're typically rather vul vulnerable. And so uh, the sharing has to take into account the potential benefits of sharing or not sharing uh, some particular pieces of information and also uh, the timeliness of the sharing is very important uh, because if the data being shared can help address uh, some of the issues, you know, maybe relieve some of the stress caused by the disaster, then uh, that would speak uh, for sharing such data. But if there are severe side effects to be expected or known or somewhat likely to occur, in response to sharing such data, then uh, the uh, likelihood of it being shared should actually be reduced. Uh, also, it's very important that, um, yeah, decisions in disaster, in in disaster contexts, they can have really profound impacts on uh, society uh, in, in either direction, like right or wrong or good or bad. 
Um, and this actually um, is rather independent on, on whether the decisions themselves are right or wrong or, and whether they are timely or not. Uh, but those are parameters that um, kind of affect the social, the societal impact. Um, and of course, decisions that are based on good quality data, applicable up-to-date data, they tend to be, um, let's say, more useful than those that are not based on data or uh, not based on high quality or up-to-date data. Okay. Um, summary on this part is, yeah, open data matters most when the stakes are high. This is from a, a US government report um, 10 years after uh, the city of New Orleans war, was flooded by Hurricane Katrina. Now we are finishing the um, open you know, the data sharing part and we're in the fair data part. So. The key idea here is to facilitate data sharing at scale, and that is between individual researchers and also groups of them, but also between researchers and others, like for instance, physicians, nurses, and government officials, uh, and uh, companies, and so on. And this sharing can occur potentially globally. Uh, another aspect of it is sharing between researchers and their research tools or between research tools and research infrastructures. So here we have basically the, the humans in the loop and here we have the machines, machinery. All of this is based on an article that came out in 2016 that kind of summarized a community-driven uh, process for developing uh, the so-called FAIR guiding principles for scientific data management and stewardship. Um, FAIR here stands for, is, a, is a, an acronym that combines uh, several concepts. The concept of findability, so the information should be findable. You should know where the, your needle in, in, the, in which haystacks that it is, or even that it is in some haystack somewhere. Um, and uh, the information should be accessible, um, like, um, he, or at least it should be clear who has access uh, or not, or by which means. And this accessibility is not just for humans, but it also extends to machines, like here. Um, fair data should be interoperable. So you, you kind of need adapters between different systems that produce or consume different kinds of data or process them in different ways. And then ideally, uh, the data should also be reusable, like uh, this house here is being reused by another species. So that's the basic idea. Now let's zoom in on a little bit. So here are some problems that FAIR data is meant to address. Um, so first, there is a certain version salad. Um, so if you don't really know which version uh, of a document is the most relevant or the most up-to-date or uh, the one that contained that particular piece that you remember of it, uh, then yeah, this is a potential problem. And uh, then there are disambiguities or ambiguities that can that need some sort of disambiguation. So whether this M Smith uh, and that M Smith are the same, or maybe not. Uh, then there's also things like link rot. So URLs or locations of things change on the web as in in real life. And at least on uh, in the digital uh, sphere, we have solutions uh, to keeping track of that. Um, and so yeah, these are problems that. Fair data can help, maybe not solve entirely, but reduce or address. So here they are in detail. Um, I will not read them aloud, uh, but I really encourage you, uh, when you're like listening to this talk, to stop here and think about it. Um, one thing I would like to point out is that the principles are termed the FAIR data principles, but essentially most of uh, the principles actually also apply to metadata. So data about the data that contains things like the identifier for the data or information about how the data was generated, these kind of things. Um, like according to F2 here, for instance. Now here is a summary. So um, in order to make research data findable, it should be deposited in a fair aligned repository that is recognized in your field. Uh, and this is why the data will be searchable and discoverable online. Yeah. So 
the, the same for the A part, the accessible. Uh, again, there is um, data and metadata. They should be uh, handled in a similar fashion. Uh, the main point here is that there is some sort of an identifier uh, and that the protocols used are being uh, that are open and metadata is always accessible even when the data themselves are not no longer there. So uh, data repositories have standard protocols in place to support online retrieval of the resource that is being described by this metadata. And also it's very important to note that fair data is often uh, mixed up or equated with open data, but the two things are essentially different dimensions of data. Um, so um, data can be fair, but not open. It can be open, but not fair. It can be either or both of, uh, of it, or it can be um, meeting certain aspects of fair, but not others, and certain aspects of openness, but not others. So. Uh, it's just different dimensions and also there are different granularities and uh, there's even different timing potentially involved. So it's important to keep those uh, concepts separated. Yeah, interoperable. Um, so yeah, we need to have mechanisms uh, to have the systems interact in, a, in, a, in an automated way. And for this, for instance, vocabularies are important and uh, metadata again plays an important role. Um, to sum this up, so uh, for instance, it's important to have open rather than proprietary file formats and to use community recognized standards for the terms, the vocabularies, identifiers, and things like that. Now, the reuse part that's potentially the, the most difficult, but it because it combines all the others. Um, so, and reuse scenarios can really vary a lot. It might be just uh, reusing something, uh, taking it as it is, and then uh, plugging it into something else. But it might also involve like um, modifying it to some extent. It might involve combining it for, with some other resources and so on. So, or or just a re replication. Um, yeah. So reuse is, is really a complex uh, thing, and here are like four principles associated with that. And they can be uh, summarized as this. So to maximize your uh, reuse, you should make sure that the metadata of the uh, resource that you're sharing is good, is complete, is up to date, and is consistent uh, with the data and so on. Um, here they also say that you should, for instance, clarify the license of the data, which basically says what are the kinds of uses that you permit. And you say, uh, they say a license like Creative Commons, which is not entirely correct because Creative Commons actually operates a number of licenses. A Creative Commons itself is not a license. It's an organization that has created a number of licenses, some of which are um, open and some of which are not, but all of which are machine readable and so in that sense fair. And so you can use those licenses to indicate access rights or use rights that um, users might have who would be using your um, resources or uh, somebody else's if the, there is a Creative Commons license attached to it. Then, um, yeah, documentation is essential to enable reuse, especially in the context of uh, replication, but also if someone wants to combine your data with some other data in order to draw further, um, like, conclusions or uh, to gain further insights into some aspect of research. Um, and this means that they need to be um, able to like verify your uh, what, what you've actually done by diving into your documentation, maybe uh, redoing parts of your research just uh, to see whether uh, it ends up giving the same results you know, when they do it and so on. Also important, um, the, the, the resources that you share, they should be linked to related research outputs. And then uh, finally, you should make it clear like how you want to be cited so that uh, people can actually give credit to you and also point their own users to the sources that they've used uh, for their own um, activities. Okay, to sum this up, fair data, 
stands for findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And now it's important to note that although we started out with FAIR data and then expanded into, uh, or, or which included FAIR metadata, now we're actually talking about to move towards FAIR science because uh, people realize that even if data were entirely FAIR, this doesn't solve the problems that FAIR is meant to address uh, entirely because even if you have a perfect data set and uh, perfect metadata around it, uh, let's say for instance all the information that you might ever need to understand how the data have been produced, then uh, this, doesn't, this still doesn't mean that you have all the tools at hand to actually do this reproduction. So for instance if the code uh, that they used to process the data is proprietary and not uh, generally available, then uh, it might actually be hard to do that step, even if they provide the precise version number of the software that they were using, uh, things like that. And uh, the same goes for uh, like material resources and, and so on. So the idea really expands from the data to all other aspects of the research cycle or the uh, research um, ecosystem or the data life cycle. Uh, so in this context um, the FAIR principles are still being used to inspire um, actual implementation of uh, the FAIR principles in different contexts. And so one thing that has come out here is the idea of FAIR digital objects which basically means that whatever resource is being created or shared it should be described in ways that um, are aligned with the FAIR principles. So um, the object is digital um, and it has identifiers and the way the object is structured and described uh, meets certain standards and yeah it has metadata about it. So now uh, how can we use that in more practical uh, rather than those abstract terms? So, uh, for instance, we could think in terms of uh, fair ethics. So, for instance, how can policy compliance be monitored? Uh, and so one way to do that or to approach that is to decompose policies into policy elements, some of which may, may be optional or not, uh, required or not, permitted or not, prohibited or not, uh, and we can um, combine them, um, or, or yeah, we can we decompose policies into such uh, elements, and then uh, we, we we check which of these are actually measurable. So things that are actually required or prohibited, um, that is that is a clear signal in a policy. If there is uh, something in a policy that says yeah you should or it, it is encouraged or something like this, this is a weaker signal. That is often hard to interpret for even for humans, but uh, certainly for machines. Um, uh, but but yeah, so the basic approach here would be to decompose policies into uh, bits and pieces that can be uh, made uh, or represented in a way that machines can make sense of it. And here we have some, let's say, guiding principles from a neighboring field where um, the description of data or data management through machine actionable data management plans uh, has been laid out uh, in a way that um, comes up with recommendations for different stakeholders, anyone who is involved in the data management cycle. Um, and uh, yeah, ethics is a part of that. And, and so ethics can be in, included here. One problem with ethics is that very often ethics related regulations, they come with phrases like uh, the researchers or the, uh, the um, beneficiaries of some funding, they are expected to adhere to applicable policies and regulations. The problem is that there is no button that uh, allows you to resolve uh, the applicable policies and regulations. Which regulations and policies apply to the particular piece of research that you're planning to do uh, or that you're planning to use? Uh, and so um, Building such a button would require describing the policies and the resources in a way that the policies and the resources can interact uh, in a way that can be logged, tracked, documented, and also analyzed by machines. Um, 
yeah, so there are some, some further examples, but uh, I'll not go into that right now. Um, all of these things, open science, fair data, and similar things, they um, share certain properties with a class of problems called collective action problems. Um, and so here I pulled out a quote, we must abandon the conceit that individual isolated private actions are the answer. They can and do help, but they will not take us far enough without collective action. So, uh, yeah, I'm asking you, can you guess who said that and in what context? And if you're watching this online, then maybe you stop here, think about it. And the solution is, that was in the Nobel Peace Prize acceptance speech of Al Gore, and he was talking about uh, basically our adaptation to climate change. Um, climate action in short. And yeah, climate action is a collective action problem because the first people who actually do, um, let's say, uh, reduce their carbon footprint, they are not necessarily the first to benefit. And uh, if that is the case, then uh, collectives tend to act in a way that is not beneficial to, to the collective as a whole because no individual benefits. So there are all sorts of classes of problems uh, like this. So yeah, I already mentioned uh, climate change and it's things like building the in infrastructure for electric charging uh, electric vehicles, um, basically adoption of any new technology or um, policy or yeah, product. And yeah, that includes, for instance, things like wearing face masks, masks while in an epidemic in a culture where uh, wearing face masks wasn't uh, a part until very recently and where shaking hands was a part and uh, things like that. Okay, um, one thing to know about collective action problems is um, they are most successfully attacked by starting with areas where the interests of the individual and the collective actors are aligned. And so from the perspective of the Institute here, we would uh, need to think about uh, aspects, areas, projects, activities, where RBMT would benefit from being more fair or more open. And once we've identified such areas, and the number doesn't have to be large, but if it is large, then we should look at common patterns and then try to identify uh, those and address those, uh, uh, let's say, examples collectively rather than one by one. So. Uh, Within those areas, we should then think about prototyping new workflows in those areas um, such that uh, we really basically uh, make use of the alignment between individual and collective interests and we watch out for edge problems or uh, scalability problems or even mission creep in the process. And all of that then helps to make those new workflows more uh, applicable to those cases where the interests between the individual and the collective are less aligned. Okay, so the graphical summary. Research is a process that has lots of different steps and uh, it can be shared um, at any of those steps. Research is a collaborative endeavor and open science uh, tries to uh, basically open up the research process in order to enhance reproducibility and also uh, give more options to participate in research, learn from research, or otherwise interact with research. Um, much of research is actually about reuse, especially the FAIR uh, principles are about reuse. And this one here is about data sharing. So data sharing can occur uh, essentially all around the world, and data sharing is the central component of um, open science. But in order to make it work, we need uh, to observe open standards, follow open standards, and also contribute to their development. So I would like to thank providers of open content and infrastructure. Um, I'm reusing here uh, a slide template that was made available under an open license by Slides Carnival. And I would also like to thank you for um, the attention that uh, brought you until the, the end of this presentation. Okay, if you want to contact me, here's, uh, here's some uh, contact data. And uh, now we can basically have a look at uh, the back channel. And with that, 
uh, we reached slide 42, which means the end. Thank you very much.